Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that scientists have figured out for sure now that your thoughts do control gene expression, and that's actually how your genes turn proteins out or create proteins. And what's kind of impressive is that the original idea for this came from a video game. <laughs> Today's guest on Bulletproof Radio is a really well-known guy, a guy I'm really honored to have on, and it's uh, it's Kevin Kelly. Uh, Kevin is a co-founder of Wired Magazine, uh, my favorite magazine for two decades now, and he's currently senior maverick at Wired Magazine, and he runs the Cool Tools website, which is a, a website that just has access to all sorts of, of amazing things you'd never think of. Um, Kevin, I, I wanted to thank you personally for telling me about the 500,000 BTU weed burner that completely like, outburns <laughs> everything else, because I've always wanted one of those, and I have weeds that are calling my name. So, <laughs> And welcome to the show, by the way. You're welcome. I am so delighted to be here. This is a great privilege, and um, I am really looking forward to this conversation. Well, you're such a fascinating guy. It's hard for me to know where to start talking with you because you're one of the founders of the Quantified Self Movement. So we'll start talking there. But you've had your your photos published in Life magazine, uh, and you, you've done an incredible variety of things that are, are just fascinating. So the real thing I want to tease out in our interview, just all of the questions, is kind of what what's powering you? Like, like how, how you get the energy, how, how you do this, where does this come from? But let's start with yeah. quantified self. <laughs> well, so the quantified self was something that, um, Gary Wolf and I started, uh, six or seven years ago. Um, and it came out of actually us noticing that there were a lot of tools being invented, um, through sensors and things like, you know, Fitbit. Um, and, we were wondering, like, how far could this go? Because it seemed like uh, the idea of being able to measure yourself was immensely powerful. And so as these things started to, the first couple came along, we realized that nobody was even talking about them. Nobody was reviewing them to suggest which ones were better. And so we decided that we would um, do two things. Was we would start a blog and trying to gather this stuff together and put it back out. And secondly, we would have a meetup and just sort of announce to the world that we were, that we were gathering all the people who are quantified selfing. And like, we didn't even define what that meant. We just said, quantified selfers show up. And it's like, let's see who comes. Um, and, uh, remarkably, um, that first session, which was here in this very studio that I'm in, uh, there was about 25 people who showed up and just said, I am quantified selfing. I am measuring myself. And um, among those people was this guy whom I, who I just heard about uh, named Tim Ferriss. Yep. So um, there were others who are now very uh, active in the movement, and they were all doing something or other, tracking things, using technology to help them track and measure themselves so they can understand themselves better. And that is really the genesis of the quantified self. It's not really even something that I was doing a lot of, Mostly that I was interested in the concept and the leverage that this would generate. And so from that day on, we've had monthly meetings in the Bay Area and they've gone worldwide with large conferences. And so there's, you know, tens of thousands of people who are now involved at some level of not just measuring themselves, but thinking about how we can do that better. It has spawned a whole industry. I, I remember in, in 2003, I started working with biomonitoring. I was working with a, a startup who had a, a stick on heart rate monitor. Uh, it was yeah. a Kleiner Perkins backed company and I was a, a consultant to them, but I designed everything that happened after the signal came off the body. How does it get to the cloud? How does it get processed in the back right. end? And then what do you do like with the data? And what I want to do was video games. <laughs> and what they want to do was cardiac monitoring for outpatient care. <laughs> and it was, right, it was right, such right, a right, gap. Right. And um, I didn't know uh, back then about uh, what you were doing with quantified self. And I think that might've been pre quantified self, but right. uh, I would have been at that meeting if I'd, if I'd heard about it right? Exactly. because I was like, the first time I went to a quantified self meetup, uh, I was like, Oh my God, these are my people. Like there was a hundred people at a loft in San Francisco. And like, this, this is so cool because everyone's talking about this and they're sharing this the same way that like an early 2600 hacker meeting w was like, you know, mm -hmm. going way back to the computer hacking scene. We're like, look, you can do this to the phone company's network and they don't even know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and bringing that whole culture into like, you can do this to the human body and like your right, body right. doesn't even know that you tricked it. it 
it's something that hasn't been done before, it, and it, it's kind of transformative. Yeah, exactly. So, so you were you were inspired with Quantified Self to uh, to get these people together, pull them into your studio, and have them start talking about it. And did you think at the time that it would grow like it has now? No, 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 no. I mean, it was it was a total experiment. There was just, uh, I mean, I, I was certain that this technology was on this inevitable rise to become smaller, cheaper, faster, better. But our own little, you know, meet meetups and our own little involvement, we had really no idea. In fact, I, I've sort of been surprised that other people didn't really sort of pile on and try and do it better or faster. But but there really wasn't need to because we were sort of growing organically. We weren't really pushing it. We were sort of being pulled along. But um, I think... Um, what remains to be seen is uh, the d degree to which um, this will continue going and how far it will go. For instance, recently I've been trying to um, trying out the idea of wearing one of these little uh, devices called a narrative, mm -hmm. and it's a camera that was based on the work that Gordon Bell was doing at Microsoft, and it takes a picture every minute or every 30 seconds, whatever you want, automatically and sends it to the cloud. And then the cloud goes through and it takes out a representative image of the scene that you're in. And it goes onto your phone so you can kind of flick through it and get a, the highlights of your day or whatever it is that you are trying to replicate. And then the next version of this will do audio and eventually video. That is a quantified self. It's not so much quantification, but it certainly is recording your your live streaming. Um, you know, it's this usefulness of it is still, <laughs> you know, we're still kind of trying to figure out what's it useful for. And so I think, um, I think we're at the point with the quantified self where it's very clear that it continues to go forward and there's more and more, but it's not really clear exactly to the degree that we want to do, I mean, how much we're going to do it all the time. And there's actually a really interesting tension. And yeah. the tension is between how much of this gathering of data about ourselves, do we want it to be automatic and invisible to us? And how much of it do we want to be aware of so they can change our behavior? And so, you know, there's a certain degree where you just want it all invisible and just collecting data about ourselves. But then, which is really easy and we get it all, but then it's harder to affect changes in behavior if that's what you want because you don't see it. And so there's another aspect where you actually want to have to do something or become aware of it or have it impinge on your consciousness so, so that it can affect behavior change. Behavior change is not the only reason why we're collecting data, but that is one of the primary ones. And so I think how far we go and where we go next is probably not as clear as what we saw a couple of years ago. And I think um, rather than the scale of it, I'm much more interested in sort of like um, the the cultural role that it plays. How how much do we want to wear the stuff, or clothes, or the Google Glass, or not wear it? Um, and I think that's going to take some cultural education, some time, some etiquette. Like, for instance, you know, when I went to a party or if I go to someone's house, do I wear it or not? Do I tell people <laughs> about it? The, you, you know, there, there's still some things we have to learn about this. And I think we can learn it. I think the evidence of cell phone rings shows that we can actually tame these things and evolve social etiquette about What's appropriate and what's not, and I and, and so so, but that to me is the real interest uh, is 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 the quality of the next step rather than how widespread it is. Your point about the usefulness of the data is is a really important one. I, I felt like there was a time in, in quantified self where there was almost like a, a data fetishism. We're like, I got the data. I'm like, but what did you do with the data? And I, I studied information systems. Uh, I, I was CTO of a basis, the wristband company. And even then, I'm like, I don't really care if I took 10,000 steps because it doesn't change your life to take 5,000 or 10,000 steps. It's not meaningful data. Like, we should even give that to people because it's it's like 
useless. And but unfortunately, it's the easiest to track, and people believe if they take more steps that it makes them better people. So, <laughs> so then you can uh, you can sell that, and there is some some value to moving, but it doesn't correlate to calories. And, and there's all these technical things about it. But what I learned in the process of working on hacking my nervous system response mm. is this. Uh, this number around 350 to 400 milliseconds and I'm forgetting the exact name of it but in the early days of, of the computing industry you had to go below this 400 millisecond response time or you didn't have a responsive system and IBM refined it down to about 350 milliseconds and it's named after some guy and when you're looking at creating behavior change if you have real-time signal processing, which means probably local, not cloud-based, and you can get a signal that says you're doing something wrong within that very narrow window, mm -hmm. you can very rapidly, which is why like heart rate variability or uh, this, uh, this my latest thing, I, I, I'm a, a fan of the Pavlock. Um, this is a, a new device. I don't know that one. Tell me about that. This is a, I'm an investor in the company, a very small investor, but more just a supporter of the company. Uh -huh. um, and what it is, it's, uh, it's got electrodes on the back and it talks okay. to your cell phone. If you don't go to the gym, when you said you'd go to the gym, it tells your Facebook friends you didn't go to the gym and it lets them press a button to shock you. <laughs> now, you might say that's incredibly masochistic, right? But it's not. The shock is mildly uncomfortable, but your nervous system hates the shock. But as an adult mind in there, you don't really mind that much. And also the sort of humiliation of knowing that your friends know and they're the ones pushing the button, but you don't know which one did it. It's incredibly motivational for behavior change. So you can create aversion to smoking and you can do these crazy okay. things. So is this really quantified self or did it go because it's not just quantifying it's like doing something and furthermore if you locked it on and it was like part of the the prison system like you could do evil things with this but if you're the guy who pushes the button to shock yourself when you do something you didn't want to do it's like clicker training a dog parts of your nervous system can be trained that way and I, i'm fascinated by that how, how does it really hurt or is it just like a pinch it depends on who you are. I do electrical stimulation training. So for me, like I, I, I barely feel it, but most people, they, they swear. Like it, it's a, a pretty significant shock for most people, but not enough to cause neurological damage or heart problems or whatever. It's, you know, static electricity and then some, not as yeah. much as a dog collar, which really will hurt. Okay. Um, no, I think you're right. In fact, one of the conclusions about what we know about the quantified self so far is that in fact, people are horrible. I mean, humans are horrible in terms of processing data or yeah. statistics or n numeracy of any sort. And you actually don't really want to have quantification. That's not a very good interface. That, in a certain sense, what we want is kind of is to resense, resensitize, to reorganize, to make new senses, to 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 for us to feel these things in ways that we couldn't. So, so evolutionarily, we have never evolved to be able to kind of actually accurately perceive our blood pressure or our glucose levels. But if we take these devices and then at first we'll quantify them, but eventually we want to kind of reprocess them so that we feel them in a different way, like you were just talking about feeling you know, a shock. But, but, but that's really crude. That's oh, sort of barbaric. <laughs> but we can do it in other ways where you actually can, maybe it goes to the brain centers or something where you can actually do something about that. That's sort of what, what the end goal really is, is, is kind of bypass the quantification entirely and make it all internal and have the machines do it but have us feel it or wear it or in some ways embody it. And then, I, I mean, I think that's where it's going in the long term. That goes so far beyond quantifying and that's yeah. into the, the biohacking realm. And I, I've been fantasizing for like 10 years about having a, a 3D tongue printer. Well, you know, they, they have those things that blind people can use and your tongue has yeah. the most things. But if you hook that up to electrodes, your sense of touch is so much better than your sense of hearing. I, I, I just finished seven days of, of intensive neurofeedback training where for hours a day I have eight channels uh, creating mm -hmm. sound or I'm I'm basically running a lie detector against mm -hmm. my own brain. And I, I've done that eight times because it just really helps me be in charge of my brain. But 
the feedback mechanism is so crude compared to a sense of tactile stuff. So if my, my watch was getting my blood sugar, my blood pressure, and it was sending a little signal to somewhere that I could easily pick up, I, I would have so much more bodily awareness than I've been able to cultivate using my native sensing network, which is pretty crude. It's pretty refined in some ways, but the, it's not labeled well. So you get these signals, but you don't know what they mean. And teasing that out is, is a whole lifetime worth of learning, and I'd like to learn that faster. Did you get to listen to the, I think it was the um, Radio Lab uh, broadcast of Birdman? The, not yet. So there was a guy who was born blind, not very uncommon. He has no eyeballs, literally no, oh, the no eyeballs at all. Echolocation guy. Echolocation. Yeah. And he learned, uh, like many uh, uh, born, children, uh, born blind children, to, to, to click and listen to it. And often, this was a surprise to me, this apparently had, is often usually um, discouraged uh -huh. among for social unacceptable, I mean, there was social unacceptable behavior, but he and his mom said, no, he let him go forward. And he'd learned, even as a kid, to see, literally see with sound. They did some MRIs of his brains and showed that, in fact, the same kind of areas of the brain that we use for vision had been remapped and used for sound. So he could ride his bicycle, he could walk down the street and tell you, there's cars here. I mean, it was, he was seeing. He couldn't see far. He could only see as far as the sound would go. But within that realm of where the sound was, he was literally seeing like you see, but with sound. And that is just amazing. That just shows some of the plasticity that the brain is capable of. And the brain will change relatively quickly when you stress it. And one of the, the things that, that's come across my radar there is that none of the things that change the brain feel very good. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's like lifting heavy weights. You kind of might get an opiate high oh. when you're done with it, but like you're going to grunt and swear and sweat, uh, and you're going to get that Interesting. Input. Now that's the first time I've heard that. That's a very profound thing that Exercising your brain may be like exercising your body in that sense that there's an element of pain that it must hurt a little bit. Things break, and that's a sign that actually progress is being made. I had not heard that before. That's a very interesting idea. It's metabolic. I wonder if, like, you know, people who are struggling, well, people like myself, <laughs> who struggle with calculus or other things, um, oh, that would make a big difference if you were told that at that time, yeah. that in fact, if it didn't hurt a little bit, you're not really going to learn it. Because that's not a message I heard growing up. It, it, I think it should be a message because it's metabolically expensive to grow new synapses. Synaptogenesis or uh, uh, myelinogenesis, the two big processes in the brain, mm -hmm. you have to have a lot of fat and it has to not be used for some other process. And so, of course, it's going to take, your brain is going to go, could you like think about something else? Maybe think about that attractive woman over mm -hmm. there. You Think about those cookies over there. It's going to distract you because it's less work to be distracted than it is to have to lay down new neural pathways. And so it sh mm -hmm. there should be a push and a struggle. And we tell people, you got to work it out in the gym, but then you're supposed to just effortlessly learn calculus. And maybe it, you're supposed to fail a few times. And, and every night with my five and, and seven year old at bedtime, I tell them, tell me something you failed at today. And then I praise them for it. Tell them that's good. That means you were trying really hard. And tomorrow mm -hmm. you can turn that into a win and you can tell me how you won. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I want them to just look at failure as like, ah, like mm -hmm. that's what it is because maybe that'll make it so they can lay down new neural pathways better. Or maybe mm -hmm. I'm just messing them up. I sure hope not. But <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I think, but I mean, I think the idea of failure is one thing, but you know, I mean, I think there's even this other metaphor, you know, of kind of exercising your muscles and the way that the muscles are, are built up through the small tears. I mean, we wouldn't say that kind of you're in a gym, you're failing all the time, although yeah. in a certain sense you are. But but there is a sense in which the 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 um, the, the hurt yeah. that you feel is due to a very positive uh, process, and so we can say the same thing in learning and intellectually that we will have some hurt, but that is actually a sign, not so much a failure, but actually a sign that there is a, a, a positive process happening. When the, when the brain delivers hurt to your conscious brain, the, the, the unconscious brain delivers hurt, it delivers hurt through feelings of failure. And uh, the biggest example of this to me was when I was doing dual end back training. And this is the kind of training. I don't know what that is. Dual what? Dual end back training. And it's a, okay. a kind of training where you're trying to remember 
something you see, a, a, a physical location on a grid, while you hear a letter. <laughs> Mm. And you're trying to remember what position on the screen at the same time you heard something. So it's mixing your visual and your auditory memory. And it looks kind of like a simple challenge. You got a, a three by three grid and you just have to remember what lit mm. up when you were hearing this letter, but it scrambles your brain and uh -huh. it increases. It's the only thing ever that's been shown to increase fluid working memory. So you can actually raise your IQ oftentimes by 10 points in 20 days, wow. measurable IQ, but I mean, I, I was, I, I had a chance, uh, right at the beginning of Bulletproof to fly around the world and train hedge fund managers. These guys are like, they control billions of dollars. They're super high performers. They're type A's. And the number of them who would complete 20 days of training was essentially near zero. <laughs> and the reason for this is after the second time you do this, these enormous feelings of failure and frustration come up. And what's going on is the brain's going, this hurts. I don't want to double my working memory. And I'm going to have to do that if you keep torturing me. So for 14 days, you beat yourself against the software, feeling like a total jerk for even trying this and probably mad at that Dave Asprey guy for suggesting it. And after 14 days, your score just goes to dunk, to dunk, to dunk. And all of a sudden you can remember, Oh, that square was lit up seven moves ago, and I heard the letter E seven moves ago. And But you have to go through the pain. And mm -hmm. pain equals, there's something else I could be doing. Anything on earth is better than this right now. And it's that act of overcoming the pain, the pain of failure there, in my mind, right, right. That, that finally got me through it. <laughs> but, right. And, and that's actually where teachers become really valuable, yeah. is that they can kind of promise you or guarantee you or persuade you that there is something a payoff at the end, which is something if you're doing this alone or even reading a self-help book, you don't you don't really necessarily have that assurance. And so it's harder to kind of keep going because you don't, uh, it's harder to believe in a certain sense that, that there will be a payoff, that it just doesn't continue to, to hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt and hurt. And so when you have a mentor or a teacher who can say to you, look, I've seen a thousand people go through this, and this is this is the stage you're at, and you're going to feel really, really terrible right now. But, but believe me, at the other end of it, over the hill, there's a nice valley, and yeah, and you'll be you'll be great. It's also the role of community, and, and it's something that you build yes. with Quantified Self. I, I imagine there are probably thousands of people now who probably wouldn't have kept tracking their data, except they told yeah. everyone that they were going to show it the next month at a Quantified right. Self meetup. So right. they right. they just kind of stuck with it and kept measuring their food or whatever else that they were doing. Yeah, it's true. I think community is, is another accountability, some of those kinds of things. It's, it, things like Fitbit and other devices have tried to do with having you uh, to be accountable in certain senses to what you're doing. And I think that's a very powerful, very, very powerful force. And that, you know, that's part of this whole movement to the social dynamics and the social media and the social technologies, which is that, you know, people together is much, can be much more powerful than you alone. And, um, we're just rediscovering that again and again and again and again. So, so let's let's shift gears a bit. And you wrote a really impactful book called uh, "What Technology Wants." Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, it was widely lauded. And uh, in fact, I have a copy of it on my, my bookshelf here. Uh, one of the, uh, in fact, I think it was Jay Abraham actually told me that I should uh, that I, that I should check it mm -hmm. out. Just reminded me to to open it up again. And. What does technology want? So for listeners who don't know about that book, like kind of in a, in a summation, what, what was the thesis behind what technology yeah. wants? So um, even though technology is you know, persuas pervasive in our lives, there is a kind of a recognition for most people that it's the main driver of culture right now. Most of the things that we're worried about in the world are caused by technology. Most of the problems are caused by technology as well as most of the new opportunities. And yet... Um, we don't really have a very good theory of what technology is. We have something uh, very similar to the theory of biology before Darwin, which is kind of like, this is one thing after another. Like the, the biologists would have these curiosity cabinets and they would just put in all these fabulous biological specimens, but there was no framework for understanding how they were related to one another. And, and technology for most of us is sort of like, that it's we have lasers and you've got GPS and you've got uh, nanoparticles. It's like there's this one thing after another. They're all just in your curiosity cabinet. And I so I set out to kind of try and find a was there something that was there a framework or was there something that was unified technology that would help us uh, evaluate 
new technologies when they came along. Um, because I'm not so crazy myself in trying to have all the latest things. I like to, to like to kind of keep a little bit of distance, and I wanted some help in trying to frame all that was happening. And I thought what I would do is is go around to all the philosophers and technology experts and interview them and have them tell me what it is, and I'd write a book. But it turned out that there wasn't a theory, so I began to kind of cobble this together. And what I came up with was uh, uh, the realization that, that basically the same dynamic that runs through this world of technology is the same dynamic that produces us. It's evolution accelerated. It's, it's the self-organizing aspect of evolution. And um, the way I kind of went after technology was to see it as, um, as a system. So, 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 you know, there's a pen and there is a, uh, a flash drive and um, there's this little camera. And none of these things are alive in any real sense of the word. But if you take the system of the factory that made this pen and the tools that support the factory and the tools that support the tools that have to make the tools that make the factory, that network of all these technologies that are codependent on each other, that depend on each other, that thing itself is almost lifelike. I call that the technium, which is indistinct from technology as singular species. There is this web of this internet, so to speak, of all the technologies in the world, and they're all dependent on each other. None of them can stand alone. So, so while I could make a, a stone axe in a weekend, nobody here could make this thing by themselves. Even all your readers together, as smart as they are, could not do that. We have this very large interconnected network of technology, and that is the technium. And that thing not only exhibits some of the behavior that we expect in evolution, but my argument is, is that it, as a system, like any system, it has its own agenda. It has its own tendencies. It has its own technium. This thing, this network of all the technology we've made, almost a civilization level, itself has a certain tendencies, certain urgencies, certain biases. That when all things being equal, technology will want to go in certain directions. And it does things. And a great example that I might suggest is, you know, current technology of the internet. Um, it wants to copy things. Copying is an inherent, vital, essential, primitive aspect of what happens in digital technology. It wants to copy and make copies of itself. Whenever you right now we're making multiple copies of this as it goes through the internet, you can't stop copying. It yeah. wants to copy. You have to work with the copying. You can't prohibit it. You can't outlaw it. You have to kind of figure out, well, how can we make and reward people for making things, even though copies will be ubiquitous? So that's the kind of example of what I'm looking at and what technology wants. And so I went through and said, well, there's some large-scale trends, large-scale tendencies in technology as a whole, like it wants to continually increase in complexity. So I can make a, uh, or, or, and it wants to increase in specialization. So I can make several different predictions that I think are gonna be pretty much on, which is that you take any device we have today, and I would say in the future, there'll be more specialized versions of it. Cameras, we continually make, even though we have cell phone cameras, we continue to make more and more specialized varieties of cameras, super high speed cameras, super high speed underwater cameras, super high speed infrared <laughs> cameras. We just goes on and on and on. And I think those are the kinds of trends I try to look at in terms of what this technology wants. It wants increased specialization, increased complexity, increased mutualism, which means that it becomes more technology becomes on, uh, dependent on other technologies. Also, we become more dependent on other kinds of technologies. It wants to increase in diversification. It wants to increase in energy efficiency. So there's lots of long-term scale things that technology is leaning towards. And my message to the readers, to everybody, is that we should embrace 
those trends rather than fight them or outlaw them. We should embrace them and try to work with that rather than trying to deny them or prohibit them. Does that mean that you're a, you're a transhumanist? It does, I think. Um, because it means that um, we ourselves are in our invention. We are our first invention. We're the first animal we domesticated. We've made our own humanity. We have made ourselves technological. So we are deeply, deeply dependent on technology. I mean, to the point of cooking has, which is an external stomach. That was a technology we invented <laughs> that changed our entire face, our jaw, our teeth, yeah. our digestive habits. When we domesticated animals and milked them, we evolved very quickly, genes for lactose uh, digestion in adults. And we're continuing to do that. And so, so, so as we have more and more technological power, we will continue to remake ourselves into something. So humanity is really not a destiny, it's a process. And I would say with the new technologies, you know, from genetic engineering to AI, we are continuing to make us and remake us. And I believe that we're going to make ourselves more human because I think when we think about what makes a human, it's just not our hairless bodies. It's the fact that we've remade ourselves and we're going to, and that, that is the definition to me of humans is the animal that has remade themselves. And so I think we're going to keep making ourselves and remaking ourselves. And that's my definition of transhumanism, which is that it's something, a trans that we're in the motion of, we are in the process of. You know, I'm not the transhuman who wants to chop my head off and freeze it and, <laughs> you know, um, or download myself into a computer. I'm not eager to do those, but, that, uh, but in the broader sense, I think we're going to uh, continue to reinvent ourselves. Uh, continued reinvention is uh, is something that that's a, a core human drive. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you there, and I'm, I'm also of the same opinion. And I'll, I'll probably piss off some of my my good transhuman friends, but I, I'm not that interested in freezing my body. Uh, I'm also not interested in uh, mummifying myself um, because <laughs> yeah. uh, those kind of seem like similar technologies to me. <laughs> they're they're both a quest for you know the the, the afterlife or, or something like that, or a quest for immortality. I'm all over the quest for immortality, but I'd like to do it in my meat rather than in uh, some vat of frozen stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, th this can get into another a area. I mean, I, I think there's some fundamental misconceptions about, um, uh, you know, um, computation and ability to download ourselves. Um, I, I, I think that the matrix the computation works on is actually very, very important. The, there's a famous hypothesis called the Church Turing hypothesis, which says that basically all universal computation is universal, so that so it doesn't matter what matrix, what substrate you do the computation on is equivalent. Well, if you look at the original theory, it says it doesn't matter, assuming you have infinite time and space. But limited time and space is the definition of reality. And so the, the, the problem is, is that in the real practical terms, the substrate that you're doing computation on does matter. And, um, I think this is my prediction that the only way you get really human-like kind of intelligence, which is only one of many millions of kinds, is if you have a very human-like substrate, like a brain. And it says that if you don't have the gray matter, you'll have a different kind of intelligence, which to me is the real value. That That's the reason to have AI is not because it can be human-like, but because it can be unhuman-like yeah. or inhuman-like or alien. And, and that's the power, we want to have different kinds of thinking. You want to think differently. That's where the power is going to be because there's going to be problems that we have as a society that we cannot uh, discover or solve with our own kind of intelligence. We need other kinds of thinking. That's what we make AI for is because it's going to think differently. And um, so easy to make a human brain that we don't really want and need to do that. If you make a 
a brain that can remember all the things like Google. It's just that, by definition, is not human. So I think um, I think the, the the hope of sort of downloading ourselves into a computer unchanged is a little misguided. I think it may be possible to transfer something, but you're certainly not going to be thinking the same way that you did before. Yeah, you might be thinking better, but it certainly will be different. So right. it, it's that whole trans, you know, at, at what point are you yeah. like, well, you're not exactly transhuman, you're like something else. And Exactly, yeah. right. So you, you might not maintain your humanity. So, so going back to, to Bill Joy's famous white paper, and he was CTO of Sun Microsystems, which has since been eaten by Oracle. <laughs> um, Bill wrote a, a seminal white paper that, that I believe Wired published yeah. probably when you were, uh, you were at the helm. And he wrote a paper about you know, the, the coming dangers of technology. And this was long before we had the cloud the way we do today mm -hmm. and some of the other uh, like 3D printers. And in fact, there's a 3D printer behind me right there. And uh, so are you concerned about some of what technology wants really not being that good for us? Actually, I'm not in general. I, I have one or two things that, that, that I do worry about. But, but Bill Joy's article was mostly about an interesting subset of technology which um, are uh, robots, computer stuff, uh, nano, and genetics. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what's interesting about those four, are basically those are all the ones that have self-replication self in it. So they can self-replicate and self-replicate and self-replicate, and that can kind of rapidly kind of cascade almost out of our control. And so the, this is something to legitimately be concerned about because... It's not just like making an atom bomb or something. It's making something that can continue to replicate and, and, and accelerate in a way that can veer out of our control very quickly. And so I, I, I and AI, of course, is one of those. And Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and others have raised concern about AI going out of control. And, um, I think there is a legitimate concern, although I think it's overblown. Um, but we, I, I'm very optimistic about it because we have, uh, existence proof already, which is children. Okay. So, so, so these things are going to be like our mind children. We can guide and instill in certain principles so that when we let them go, they can, um, be guided themselves and even pass the guidance on. So, so we know that in theory this can happen. Um, it's a matter of us doing it. And I think actually we're beginning to do that right now and trying to instill, like, say, ethics and morality kind of, so to speak, into, like, say, driver, uh, computer driven cars. They have to make decisions, sometimes make choices. And the interesting thing to me is that by doing this, it's like having children, they make you better. I think we're going to become better ethicists and better in a moral dimension because we have to teach these very dumb computers how to do this. And we're going to realize that we're actually not very good at it. You know, we think that, well, we're superior as we're driving down the street. But, you know, as you know, the old trolley dilemma is like, it's a dilemma. There's no real answer. And we think that we have this all sorted out, but we actually aren't, we're actually very sloppy about it. And I think by, having to program another generation of creation to do this, we're going to become better at it ourselves. So that's my one answer to Bill Joy's where we're going is, is that I think, yes, I think it is, it is a very big challenge. I don't think, I, I think, but I think it's a challenge that's good for us because I think it will actually make us better in the process. That is a very eloquent answer. And, and, I'm still blown away by the number of different projects and things that, that you've done that, that have had really broad reaching impact. And, and I'm torn because we're running towards the end of the interview. And, and I want to ask you about The Well, which is one of the first intact online communities, really. And, and you played a, a hand in that. Mm -hmm. And I also want to talk to you about Out of Control, your book about decentralized emergent systems that mm -hmm. was the Wachowski, although I say their name probably wrong, the guys who wrote The Matrix, the best movie right. ever, uh, basically cited this as one of the things that inspired them to write the book. So of those yeah. two stories, which one are listeners going to care about the most? Because <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's talk about Out of Control and The Well and The Matrix, of course. The Well uh, the well was, just briefly, was the, one of the original pioneering online um, 
communities and we and um we started in 84 85 and i I learned a humendous amount about the online world and one of the biggest surprises for us was how fast people online really wanted to meet face to face yeah and how that kind of virtual relationships really drove physical real life relationships and so i was kind of in some ways buoyed by that because I realized that these were not substitutes for the rest of our lives. These were actually augmentations to it. And that was one of the lessons I took about the well and the well community. I, I, was, a, I was a member of the well back then, not in 84, but um, going back to probably 91, 92 mm-hmm. time, timelines. So. Yeah. It was still very, very active then. It was yeah. almost at its peak. Um, and uh, Out of Control was a book that um, I felt was where it was really trying to deal with um, this idea of decentralization, decentral control, um, and how you could make things, um, something smart from a lot of dumb things. And the metaphor that I used was the hive mind, the beehive that actually is has a longer memory than individual bees and is a, is a much more powerful being so as a, as a super organism than the individual parts and how the emerging internet was beginning to resemble some of those kinds of things. And, um, I think that was the, the aspect of the book that the Wachowski brothers or siblings were, um, interested in was the third movie where you have this organic swarm thing that was at the, basis of of um their world and um what we've seen playing out since uh, the book's you know 20 21 years old at this point um is is how uh more and more of um both businesses institutions and the, the net itself is is been moving very very steadily towards decentralization i mean that's that's kind of the the big the big trend in our culture in the last 30, 40 years is this decentralized, is this leveling of the hierarchies into the power of what you can do with a decentralized system. And I want yeah. to make one clarification about that, which is that there's a limit that while Wikipedia is really fantastic, Wikipedia is the kind of Wikipedia and Uber are kind of the two classic emblems and icons of this. Um, the Wikipedia is better than any encyclopedia that we had before, but it's not the ultimate encyclopedia. And that while the completely decentralized bottom is by far the best way to start anything, and it will always take you further than you think you could go, but it won't take you all the way. Wikipedia itself is beginning to have other levels of hierarchy added onto it. They freeze articles. They do all kinds of things from the top down to make it better. And eventually, in the goodness of time, even the Wikipedia will be some kind of combination of some of the Encyclopedia Britannica, high-end editing, and the bottom, because you need both. And Uber and all these other ones that are kind of re- decentralized, they will, over time, accumulate you know, vetting of drivers and all those kinds of stuff that come from the top down. You need both to get to where we actually want to go. But the decentralized bottom-up will always take you further than you thought you could go. It's always the best place to start. And we haven't yet finished exploring to see how far that will go. And so that's the big drive right now in the world of almost any kind of technology is how much can you do with this decentralized bottom? And the answer is far more than we thought. Um, as a, a technologist, I, I played a, a, a real role in the rise of the data center business model, which is basically mainframes. It's giant centralized data centers. But the last five years of my career in tech, uh, I was talking about what I call the ambient cloud, the idea of get it out of the data center. Like It's much better if all the files are on your iPhone than if you have to download them each time you need them because of this thing called physics and, and all of this. And what's been the biggest surprise for me as a technologist and to some extent a technology futurist is um, how slow the decentralization has happened. And the things that slow it down are usually governments and control institutions. So they make really inefficient systems because they want to be able to control them. When you talk about what technology wants and, and you look at these emergent behaviors, are we going to just break them with regulatory stuff? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, make no mistake that there's going to be a lot of conflict. The established ways of doing things will rebel and fight against and try and stop this. There's winners and losers. And um, in, in the legal realm especially, the legal is always, you know, playing catch up to technology. We'll always run ahead. Um, I, I think there's certainly going to be pushback. But um, I, I think the, the real solution to this is actually to, to continue to decentralize and defragment the, 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 the lawyer system. The, 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 I mean, law is really interesting because it's, it's a code. And we know, we, the technologists, we know code. And so um, I think um, part of what we want to do is actually to try and uh, accelerate a revision in how we make legal code in order to try and make it run a little bit faster because it, it is way, 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 way behind. But I think there, I think that is a friction. I mean, I think that's going to be a friction that'll be around for at least a century. Um, and in a certain sense, what code has always done, uh, legal code, is sort of just fixed what is being done socially. And what we want to try and do is accelerate that process. So we saw that in the copy world, okay? Everybody was copying, and, and the law just has to absorb the fact that there was a kind of a consensus, a social consensus, that certain amounts of this was okay. And so that has to be brought into the law, but it, but it, it's just, it just takes so long, so we need to accelerate the ways in which we can capture the consensus into law and to uh, make it more flexible. Um, and there's, you know, the sunset guys, and there's many people thinking about how to do this, laws that have to, that re, you know, that elapse themselves um, after a certain amount of period, have to be renewed. I mean, I, uh, Tim O'Reilly works with the government 2.0. Government is, is really been ignored for better or for worse. And I am one of the people who tend to ignore it, but I, I, I really, I really, um, admit that, um, we could do a lot better at devising a way to have governance that works. And it will take, uh, talk about pain. It's going to take a lot of pain to do that because government's all about, um, resolving inherent conflicts. It's all about compromise. There's, there's just a lot of things, but, we can learn how to use technology to help us do that. And so I think that um, uh, the law will always be behind, but we can actually make it not so behind. Got it. So, so the law won't hold technology back for that long. I, I, think, I think it is always holding it back, but I think we can make it hold it back less. Okay. Uh, in a certain sense, you want law to be a little conservative. Yeah. I mean, I think that's okay to have a little bias where it's kind of like saying, Hey, Hey, wait, 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 wait. But you, you just have to, we just want to, to, you know, remove a couple of those weights. So it just says, Hey, wait, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> well said. <laughs> now here's, here's the, the, the really big question that we're getting to it. And people who have listened to this whole interview by now know that you're, you're a deep thinker and you've had a, a unusually large impact on many different, uh, different aspects of society, like, like, um, very, uh, very broad things uh, that, that are, are still like way ahead of the curve. How do you do that? Like, like what drives mm. all of this stuff? Because there are very few people on the planet who can lay yeah, claim yeah. to the number of things that you've done like this. What, what, what's behind that? That's a good question. Um, because I'm going to work in one mention of, of, of one of my latest projects, which is a graphic novel that we kickstarted um, two years ago, and um, it's about um, angels and robots. It's it's about uh, a young coming of age story for a young girl who figures out that um, the newest conscious robots are going to be sold from angels, of which there's a million different species. <laughs> who want to shortcut the normal process of getting bodies and jump into these robots without being adequately prepared morally or, or constitutionally. And so um, what I try to do is um, 
uh, there, there, there are some tricks in, in people like Brian Eno, someone who I know, has taught me some of these really good rules. And um, the thing that I'm always uh, inspired by, maybe that's the word, is um, stories about things that we um, thought were true that turn out to be false later on, and things that we thought were false and were true later on. And, and the ability to change our mind. So, so in a certain sense, nothing gives me more satisfaction than having my mind changed. And what I'm trying to do is to is to su surprise myself, to change my mind, and that entails kind of constantly questioning my own beliefs and assumptions and the assumptions of others. And so there's a little bit of a, I mean, it's a game maybe, I guess you would call it, of trying to say, of, of trying to view things from a different angle. And that's that lateral thinking that they talk about, which for me is, is just pleasurable. And um, so, so the ultimate motivation is, is I find a pleasure in learning about things, questioning things, trying to imagine what if in the way the science fiction writer might. And it's sort of a, it's a joy. I mean, it's, it's propelled by joy. It's simply a, the joy of discovery. And that coming in from the angle is actually one of the reasons why I travel a lot and why, why I think travel is so important for me anyway, is that I go somewhere far and strange and by being out, and looking back in is another opportunity to try and see things from a different angle. Brian Eno has this thing he does with bands. He'll say, okay, band, pretend that you're uh, an African factory and you're making music. It's like, so you, you suddenly are seeing in a different world. Pretend that you're, and Marvin Minsky does this, another thinker. He's, he pretends he's a Martian. And he's, you know, he just, He's not assuming anything is true, not that humans are better than anybody else or anything. He's, he's assuming he's a Martian coming in and questioning things as if he was an alien. And I think um, that is sort of that playfulness, maybe is the word, is what, I'm, what I seek and what gives me pleasure um, of trying to... Um, not take things too seriously, even the things that I believe really strongly, um, and subjecting them to like, well, what if that wasn't true? What if the quantified self was a total fad? What if uh, technology, what if Moore's Law doesn't run for another year? Then what happens? What if um, it runs for a thousand years? It's sort of, it's, it's a playful approach the stance of fun in a certain sense to that um, opportunity that we have to try to imagine um, what could be and not just um, what is. Very, very cool. And uh, I was wondering if you'd have a quantified self answer, but I actually monitored what I was doing and I can, <laughs> I can tell you what makes me tick. But uh, th so what I heard there was, was joy and a sense of playfulness and uh, sort of continuous questioning from different perspectives are, are the things that are really motivating you. Yeah, it is. And, um, uh, and I think that has, you know, um, and if, for whatever reason, um, you know, I was growing up, I was really interested in art and science, which I think is actually, you know, to me, my wife's a scientist. It's, it's a, you know, if you ask what drives them, it's this kind of curiosity. I mean, it really is. If they, each time they do an experiment and it doesn't work, it's like, well, what is going on? I have to know. I just need to know what is going on. And so a lot of the pursuit can be propelled with money to make like a drug, but in fact, Ultimately, it's this curiosity about how things work that really drives them individually. And I think, um, for me, you know, uh, I, I couldn't decide whether to go to MIT or to art school because I was interested in art and photography as a, it was a way of investigating the world. And, um, I think, um, I think play is underestimated as as a both a um 
what's it, a uh, driver and as a um, as a as a, as a prime motivation, um, and I would like to honor that. Very, uh, very well said, and uh, incredible to get a chance to ask you that question. I, we we've passed briefly at the Quantified Self conferences and you know said hello and all, but not really had a chance to sit down. So what a what an amazing answer. And there's there's a question that I've asked every guest, all two hundred and something on Bulletproof Radio at at the end of the show, and, and it's. Given all of the things that you've experienced and all of your knowledge, which in your case is a very unique set of things, uh, what are the top three recommendations that you'd make for someone who, who wants to, to perform better at whatever it is they're here to do? So, so whatever they want to do, whether they want, just want to be a better parent, they want to be a better entrepreneur, it doesn't matter. You want to perform better. These are the three most important pieces of advice you have to offer. The three most important pieces of advice. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, one I kind of hinted at already, yeah. which is that um, I think you are, and this was a quote from um, Tim Larry, which was, um, you're only as young as the last time you changed your mind. <laughs> okay? So to stay young, keep changing your mind. Esther Dyson has another quote, a friend who is a I like very uh, prominent... Uh, investor and VC funder. Um, she says, keep making new mistakes. And this goes back to, to the kind of things you were talking about, about teaching your son's uh, failure. So her, her uh, contribution was new mistakes. So you should make the same mistakes. You want to make new ones. She's an incredible woman. Uh, yeah. uh, I pitched her with when I was with Basis, and she was so helpful. I, I was really just grateful for her as a human being. So, yeah, good good call yeah. to quote her. Keep making new mistakes. And um, uh, and, the, and the third one is a little bit more complicated to, to, to talk about, but um, uh, there was a... A, a, a axiom, something people repeat that is true to some extent, which is this idea of Joseph Campbell's follow your bliss. You want to f follow, rather than follow the money, follow your bliss. But um, I was persuaded of contrary view by a guy, Cal Newport, I think his name is, who wrote a book called um, Too Good to Ignore. And what he says is that what you want, the way you get to your bliss is by mastering something. And that rather than that you um, find your bliss and then you master it, you f you get to your bliss by mastering something, and that mastery helps you to move towards your passion. So a lot of people, young people, are often um, paralyzed in the beginning because they yeah. don't have a passion. Yeah. And they're saying, I need a passion, I need a passion, I need a passion, and they, they don't have the passion, and they feel, feel like they can't go forward. But in the very beginning, what you want to do is you want to just become so good at something that they, that people can't ignore you. you. You really just want to give your heart to something, and it almost doesn't matter in the beginning. Just give 100%. Even if you aren't super passionate about it, just decide that you're going to master something. And in that mastery, you can move yourself to something that you are just passionate about. So mastery is a way to arrive at your passion. Wow. And um, I think that's a much more practical and ultimately satisfying way to to approach the possibilities of the world, which is don't kind of wait till you're passionate about something. Begin now with almost anything and try to become so good at it that people can't ignore you about it. Wow. So I have never heard mastery as a, as a path to bliss uh, out of 200 something people, but what a, a very eloquent way of, of putting that. Wow. Th thank you for that thought. I, I've never thought of it, but it makes so much sense just right on its face. So that, that's a gem. Yeah. I'm sure your own life, you, you probably recognize I that, do. that yeah. you, you probably became really good at something that is not where you ended up. I mean, it's sort of where you started, but you became so good at it that you could then move into the, to the next state. And I think, that idea of that, that wherever you're going to start is probably not where you're going to end. So start by becoming really, really good at something. Put that 10,000 hours in, whatever it is. It may not be where you'll end up, 
with the greatest satisfaction, but you'll get there by that being so good. Very, very well said. People finish hearing this interview, I'm sure they're going to want to hear more about your work. And normally I can name a URL, <laughs> tell people where to go, but you've got so many different projects underway. Where should people go to find out more about all the cool stuff that you've got your hands in? Yeah, so I'm pretty Googleable. Yeah. Actually, my email has been public for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so kk 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 kk.org, very easy to find. But um, my website, kk.org, has a bunch of stuff, cool tools, where we review one and recommend one really great cool tool every weekday. I have a site called True Films, where I review the best documentaries. And I've been doing that for at least 15 years. And... Um, uh, I'm pretty active on Google Plus for weird reasons, um, <laughs> where I actually um, post stuff and reply. Um, you know, I, I don't read much Twitter, but I, I do have, I, it is broadcasting. So um, I'm pretty accessible at kk.org. Okay. Um, anything you want to find out is, is there. Kevin, thanks for asking. Oh, of course. Uh, thanks very much for being a guest on Bulletproof. And just thanks for all the things you've contributed to the evolution of technology. Sure. It, you've had a, a meaningful hand in a lot of the things that have, have been a huge part of my career. So, you know, hats off and, and thank you. Well, thank you for the privilege of being here and chatting with you. I um, am honored to be on your show. And um, it was a really great conversation. I had such a good time. And um, I appreciate all the work that you're doing with Quantify Self in the greater arena of technology. More power to you. Keep going. Keep making new mistakes. Awesome. Great. If you enjoyed today's show, you know what to do. Go onto iTunes and click like and tell someone how cool this was. And while you're at it, check out Cool Tools and check out <laughs> what Kevin's up to because uh, he's one of the great minds of our generation, at least in my uh, geeky opinion. So uh, have an awesome day and thanks for listening to Bulletproof Radio. <laughs>